And so you both mentioned the fine tuning of the universe. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that discovery comes from science. Um, And so in your last interview with Richard Dawkins, he said, this was the nearest approach to a good argument. Uh, so, <laughs> and so, concerning most people are listening to this are, are novices to science. Can you unpack what what fine tuning is? Sure. El ajuste fino del universo, diseño inteligente o una simple coincidencia. Veamos el siguiente argumento. And it's a fairly recent realization, actually. You know, we do have this remarkable set of equations that govern the behavior of matter and energy. The gravity uh, it follows an inverse square law uh, that the speed of light is fixed. Um, that um, all, all of the properties of the atom uh, follow certain abilities and rules about how they stick together or fly apart. Those laws, beautiful as they are, have constants in them that I don't know really anybody who will say we can derive the value of those constants from first principles. They're related to each other, so maybe there's some connection between them, but you can't figure out what they have to be on the basis of theory. You have to go and measure them. And so they have a particular value. And maybe the easiest one to explain is gravity, because that's certainly familiar to us in every day. So yeah, there's that inverse square law, and there's the gravitational constant. And that is, of course, important uh, in the beginning of the universe uh, for the way in which, after an inflationary period of everything flying apart, they began to actually coalesce. And that's how we got clouds of gas, which then became ultimately stars and planets and moons and ultimately us you're talking about it so gravity is pretty important but if you tweak the value of that gravitational constant just a little bit depending on who you ask and whose calculation you did i mean a very little bit maybe one part in a million what is the one part in a million a one like how can you contextualize that <laughs> okay if you imagine the gravitational constant out to seven decimal places and you change that last decimal place that was an eight into a seven and the rest is all the same. And then you go through the math about what would happen if it was just a little bit weaker. There isn't quite enough there uh, to get the coalescence to happen. And so you end up with things just flying apart in a pretty boring, sterile way. If you make it just a little stronger, then things come together a little sooner. But also the expansion of the universe has a limit. And knowing that it takes billions of years before you get to the point where something uh, like complexity of chemistry can happen because of all the things that have to happen in stars, you'd never get to that point. Uh, everything would collapse back in a big crunch. Mm. So in order to have this possibility of something beautiful and interesting, that had to have exactly that value. And the strong and the weak nuclear force and multiple other constants all have to have that same property. So you're talking about like the conditions needed for life to exist on Earth. Or for anything interesting. It's not just about this kind of life or this kind of Earth, just anything beyond some particles, which hard to me to imagine much intelligence coming out of particles flying apart by themselves. So anything that you would call thought seems to require these particular parameters to be set in a very precise way. And that seems to cry out for an explanation. And again, as somebody who also finds beauty in the equations, uh, I find awe in the values of those constants, and they do call out to me for an intelligence that is far beyond anything I could possibly imagine, who I don't think had to sit there and punch and look at just do and thought, and here it was. <laughs> And I get it that the alternative is that there are an infinite number of other parallel universes. And of course, we have to be in the one where something interesting could happen to have this conversation. But the inability to ever measure, except in the weirdest sort of way, uh, the possibility that those really exist, seems then to require a great leap of faith uh, to believe in the multiverse maybe for me, greater than believing in a creator who made it this way for our universe. So, yeah, I, I think it seems a little too easy <laughs> to dismiss that and go, well, it's the multiverse. Think about that. The other thing is, that doesn't solve the question of why there's something instead of nothing. Yeah. Sort of the big ultimate question. And that also seems to require some kind of an uncaused cause to have their be some. Yeah. So, I mean, in essence, it was fine tuning. I think I saw this online somewhere, but someone was saying like if you took a pencil or something, 
and you like threw it across the universe at a bullseye on like Pluto or something that like the like and hitting it would be like that would be the chances that life would exist or something. And so the argument essentially is that f- with fine tuning, life is just so incredibly unlikely that like what is the explanation for that? And I've heard you talk about this a little bit in um in in your podcast and interviews, and I think you said that this. You find this compelling, but it doesn't really move you, really. But so, can you explain what you're? Yeah, take I mean, of is? course, it's compelling. It's, yeah. it's, it's a great mystery, and it's an amazing finding, right? Mm-hmm. That if we were to adapt these values, then nothing could exist. There are so many questions that spring up in my mind. There are just so many. It's just difficult to know where to begin. I mean, we said for a moment ago, you know, God doesn't punch in those numbers. He just kind of knows that that's how it has to be. He doesn't have to punch any. <laughs> is, is God is God constrained by these constants? He chooses to be. He chooses to be. I don't know that in his existence, those constants exist. He's not part. He created, but he is not himself part of the created universe. So this is the thing that, that sort of confounds me, is that before the universe exists and you just have sort of God up in the ether, and he's sort of <laughs> thinking about creating this universe, to put it crudely. And for some reason, God is confined to these very narrow restraints and in fact could not create a life permitting universe but within those constraints and those con- and 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 therefore before this universe is even created god is in some way constrained by the strong and weak nuclear forces i don't understand that at all uh, you're suggesting that god is part of the creation that god put in place for the universe. God doesn't have to be constrained that way. God is outside of space, outside of time. Yeah. Not not basically having to adhere to any of so. I don't mean that God is constrained by those forces, that they're like acting upon him. I mean that he's constrained in the sense that he can only create a material world that abides by those particular constraints. Oh, I think he could create any material world. I think he wanted to create one that was interesting. And so he made the selection of those equations and those constants in order for it not to just be a big waste of time. But would it have been impossible for him to create a universe that's life permitting and just as interesting mm, in know. which gravity was stronger? Well, I don't think it would have been as interesting. But I, I, but, I was interested in thought. But, but, but I mean a thought for missing universe, right? So, so like a universe where basically everything is the same as it is now. Let's say that, um, that, that gravity is stronger, but this dark energy that's causing the universe to expand is a bit stronger, or there's some other introduced force, or, or in other words, when God goes to create the universe, is he constrained in the sense that if he wants to create this thought permitting universe, that everything has to be so finely balanced. In other words, I'm not sure why the meta conditions are set up so that everything is on, on such a knife edge. Uh, maybe I can spell it out like this, right? So uh, imagine I, I have a friend who, um, Phil Halper, who made this documentary about the, the fine tuning argument. And there was a really interesting response that made reference to the Gnostic Christian tradition. The, the Christian Gnostics believed in the, the sort of the material world being the product of an evil demiurge. It's like uh, the, this God of the Old Testament is the, is the evil creator of the material world mm-hmm. and Jesus represents the true God who is you know, spiritually pure and above all. And he was like, well, doesn't the fine-tuning argument kind of fit in better with this kind of picture of the universe? Why? Because the spiritual creator who, who realizes that the material world is evil and terrible doesn't want the material world to come about. And so he makes it so that it is near on impossible for a material universe like this to exist. And yet the evil demiurge wants to create that universe. And so he comes in and he perfectly tunes everything. So although it's completely improbable, he just makes it right that the material world can, to, can be created. But I think that this kind of slightly um, contrived image can help to demonstrate is that the very fact that it is so difficult to bring about the, the material world, but by finely tuning these constraints is itself sort of a, a backfiring against the existence of a creator God who wants there to be a universe like this and has the power to do it in any way which he pleases. For example, another analogy from the same documentary, if, if, you, were to, if you were to have like a, a, a bag of, of, of balls and you were pulling out, uh, pulling out a ball and you were trying to figure out what the favorite color of the, of the creator of the, of the bag was and you reach in and you pull out a purple ball, that might be confirming evidence that the creator of the game likes the color purple. 
But if you then tipped out every other ball and looked at every single other one except for the one that you picked was yellow, you might actually think to yourself, oh, okay, the, the creator of this game clearly prefers yellow, but I just happen to have picked the blue one. Now, obviously, that analogy doesn't work because that revolves around chance. Mm -hmm. But the point specifically being that if the conditions are set up so that there are an almost infinite number of ways that things could have been when none of this could have happened and only one very precise way that it could have happened, the person who sets up that meta condition, what are we to make of, of, of their view of, of the universe? You see what I'm saying? I think I see where you're going. And I don't think there's just one way uh, where you could set uh, the constants and the equations to end up with something interesting. This happens to be a really well-studied one that we happen to live in mm -hmm. the middle of. Again, going back to Martin Rees' book, uh, just six constants or whatever, it's close to that. Uh, he would argue that these constants are related to each other, so they don't have to have the precise values they do now as long as their ratios are right. So the yep. six dimensionless constants that he outlines, including the cosmological constant. And if those are off by just a little bit, things don't work. But there's lots of solutions within that. So I think more of God is an artist. And, of course, an artist can paint a lot of things that are really not very interesting and then occasionally a masterpiece, but not usually just one masterpiece. So God has the opportunity to decide which of the masterpieces are going to be considered worth doing because they're interesting and you live in one of those. I'm not saying it's the only one that could have been. It's just the one that we have. And it fits the description of what would need to be a very precise thought process to end up with something that would be more than just sterile particles. Mm -hmm. Well, you keep using the word interesting, and it really makes me think of, I mean, the, the thing that sticks out about this whole thing is how unlikely it is that, that life would be, exist. And so it almost makes me think of even, you know, in America, you know, if there's an underdog sports team that, that, that wins, that is so incredibly unlikely that they would win, it like it sticks out to humans, like as something that's remarkable and you keep talking about interesting and beautiful. Um, is that, is that kind of really what you're getting at? Is that, is that God made it interesting and that that sticks out to us because of how unlikely it is? Because it's unlikely and because it has complexity. I guess that's what I'm saying. Interesting. I, I don't think small particles flying apart forever is very interesting. <laughs> I think something where you have a coalescence of stars and planets and chemistry that gives rise to uh, amazing constructs, I think that's really interesting. And especially if it gives rise to something that allows through an evolutionary process, the development of creatures with big complicated brains that can have a conversation like this mm. and can even feel some draw upon them somehow to reach back out to God who we're not sure is there, but certainly feels like we're called to. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, But to be clear, I mean, do, do you think that it would have been impossible for God to create that universe, that interesting universe in which atoms and nebulas and, and planets and humans ultimately form? It would have been impossible for him to do that with gravity being stronger. I think it would not have been impossible. I don't think God chose to spend the energy of creation on something boring, <laughs> at least just judging by what's around us. But I, I mean, I mean to, to create the same universe, so, so not a boring universe. It's still an interesting universe. Everything is the same. We're, we're still acting as we're acting now. It's just that gravity is stronger. I think if that had happened, we would have had a big crunch before there was time for the complexity of chemistry to form in the heart of those stars, and it would have been not very... Important. So it would have been impossible for God to create that universe and there not be a big crunch. I think if the only thing that was altered was mm -hmm. gravity, everything else kept the same, the, the theoreticians would say, yeah, we had had a collapse of the universe before now. We would not have made it to 13.8 billion years. So that means then that provided God wants to create this interesting universe as it is today, God is constrained in doing so. He chooses. By the conditions... Of great, yeah. But so once he's made that choice that he wants this universe, he wants an interesting. He can't make that interesting universe, but by this very specific value of the constant of gravity, and so that acts as a constraint on God's creative power, because God wants to create this beautiful thing. It, it's kind of like saying, it's kind of like saying, you know, if God wanted to create the Mona Lisa without using like a paintbrush. Like, 
traditionally, I think theists would want to say, well, he could do that. He could just pop it into existence. There are ways of God to sort of get around our physical constraints. And if I said, well, no, no, I, I think that God chose to use a paintbrush because otherwise the Mona Lisa couldn't have been created and that would have been uninteresting. But the question I'm asking is, could he have made the Mona Lisa without the paintbrush? Could he have created the world as interesting as it is today with a stronger force of gravity? You know what I mean? Like, I, I understand what you're saying, that, he's, that, he's, that he wouldn't choose to have a, a, a gravity that has a, a universe that has a big crunch because it wouldn't lead to life. That would be so uninteresting. But what I'm saying is, why couldn't there be a stronger uh, constant of gravity that in our current model would lead to a big crunch? But because God is God, he can create that universe nonetheless and avoid a big crunch somehow. Or is he constrained by the, the constant of gravity and what he can create? I think, I think I see where you're going. I think God is a God of order. And that meant that in any universe, God would choose to have matter and energy uh, follow orderly laws. Mm -hmm. We happen to have a set of those. They might have been otherwise. We haven't talked about whether you could come up with a completely different universe where gravity was an inverse cube instead of an inverse square. Mm -hmm. That sort of makes my head hurt. But within the uh, nature of the laws that seem in this universe to govern matter and energy, if God is a God who's interested in something complex, and let's come back to my faith here, God is also a God of love. God, God wants to have creatures that God can have relationship with. And that is going to guide the decision-making then about what kind of universe will achieve that goal. I don't think that's, it's constrained by the fact that God wants to love his creatures. That's who he is. And if that's the case, I don't know that it's constraining him in terms of physics to choose the right parameters to make that happen. It's a, it's an, it's a means to the end. The end is what mattered. But he couldn't have got that same outcome through different parameters. That's the constraint that I'm talking about. Unless you change the laws also, and I don't know how you would do that, if you're going to stick with the laws we've got mm -hmm. and just change one constant, gravity, and expect that to end up with complexity, it won't work. Even for God. Even God couldn't make that happen. You know, this sort of feels like, well, God could decide two plus two can be five. and that Right, right, be... right. So, so but that, that's what I'm asking is, is, are these fundamental constants something like, you know, laws of logic, like, like two and two is five, in which case, like, because if, if, I ask a, if I ask a believer in God, do you think that God is constrained by the laws of logic? Oftentimes they say, in, like, in a sense, yes, but that's not really a problem because these are just the laws of logic. What I'm asking is, are things like the, the strong weak nuclear force and the strength of gravity like the laws of logic and that they plausibly constrain yeah. God in the way that the laws of logic might? That, that seems to me a really unusual thing. Like when someone says, God couldn't make two plus two equal five. I don't see that as a, as a challenge to his omnipotence because it's logically impossible. That, 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 that kind of thing, like a, a four-sided triangle, he can't create that because it literally has no referent. It's not a thing. God can do all things. Four-sided triangles just aren't things. And so I totally understand that. But if it's, well, God couldn't create a life-permitting universe, in which everything was the same except for gravity being two times as strong, he couldn't have done that. Well, I do see that as a challenge to his omnipotence because that doesn't seem like a logical contradiction in well, the same way. It seems like a, a physical contradiction, but not a logical one. I guess the other factor here that we haven't said explicitly is that God apparently is interested in nature following order. And the fact that there are those equations governing matter and energy, they didn't have to be there. Mm -hmm. But if you'll give, if you'll take as a given that God is interested in order mm -hmm. of nature, and also that God is interested in having relationship with complicated creatures like us, then I think the only means to that end is to have that gravity constant in our universe be what it is. And so, yeah, I guess you could say, there's a constraint there because otherwise God's goals are not achieved.